just for okay let's get started and you guys can hear me fine yes all right so it's uh, been over eight months since i started my work as a functional consultant at odoo an erp software company uh enterprise resource planning uh, so they're the competitors of companies like Salesforce, SAP, and Netflix, or NetSuite. And my job as a consultant is to work with business owners and key stakeholders to implement the ERP. Yeah, for sure, but it does work on a smaller scale, namely in five time zones spanning China, which since 1949 runs on one unified time. For Beijing, uh, that meant no change at all. Oh shit, hey Curtis. Okay, <laughs> yourself. Okay, and okay, uh, my job as a consultant is to work with business owners and other, other people in the business to implement the software so that it works properly with their business flow. And it's definitely been challenging. The learning curve is pretty steep because I have to be knowledgeable about the value chain from front end operations like sales and marketing to back end operations like inventory and accounting, my worst nightmare. So uh, I've uh, angered, annoyed, and frustrated clients during this time. And I've definitely received complaints as well. So I wanted to share with you guys one of the emails that my client sent to his sales rep, uh, who is my colleague. Okay, so hey, hope you're doing well. Uh, we're having some concerns regarding the accounting side of the implementation. There seems to be a lack of confidence on best approach for both parties involved internally here and between us and Carmen. Are you free for a brief phone call just to see our options, best course of action to get it done right? Not today, but tomorrow or Monday. Uh, so then the sales rep pinged me and asked me what was going on. And at that point, I felt inadequate and rejected because my client's email indicated that he didn't trust me, um, even though he didn't exactly explicitly say any complaints or something. It's just from the tone of his email, you could tell. I felt embarrassed because he brought it up to my colleagues and then anxious about my talk with both the sales rep and my client. And I'm sure you've encountered similar situations as well. Upcoming conversations that you dread and find unpleasant that you avoid or feel anxious about. These are the difficult conversations because, first of all, our self-esteem is implicated. Um, the issues at stake are important or the outcome uncertain. Um, when we care deeply about what is being discussed or about the people whom we're discussing it with. So these conversations can occur at home with your friends, with your family, in public, or at work. And for me, difficult conversations, um, yeah. Some examples are when I have to talk to my parents about boundaries because I live with them, or when there's a friend in my friend group that continually brings down the mood, so I feel like I should talk to him about it or even at work when there's client complaints. Um, so take a few min minutes right now to think about a recent or pending conversation that you had or will have, and then just jot it down on the side. Meanwhile, I'm going to, let's see. I'm gonna try breaking you guys out into breakout rooms, but uh, just uh, take a moment to think about it. Okay, so I'm gonna break you guys off into a room for a minute and talk to your group mates about maybe a difficult conversation that you've come across or something you've heard from someone else.
So you should see a button that says uh, join a breakout room. That's Peggy. <laughs> Peggy, you and I can hang out. <laughs> Welcome back. Can everyone or can someone share a difficult conversation? Just briefly, you don't have to tell me the whole thing, but that uh, that has occurred or you're gonna have it in the future. Uh, what, what did Curtis say? I didn't, I didn't hear. Mm, Curtis, uh, different political, sorry, I'm eating. Um, different political viewpoints of friends. Oh, yeah, yeah, that can definitely be a difficult conversation, mm -hmm. especially if you have, yeah, different viewpoints. Um, our group talked about, like, at home, how to talk to their parents about, like, social and, like, racist, social and racism issues going on in today's world. Mm. Yeah. That's a good one. Okay, thank you for sharing. Um, so the goal of today is to review some concepts and tools that will help you deal with your difficult conversations so that you'll feel less stressed and more confident when you're about to speak or go into a conversation with someone. And I want you just to keep what you wrote down or what you just thought of um, by your side as We'll be reflecting on them throughout this event. So the first step in having a better conversation is to understand the underlying structure of a conversation. And why is understanding the structure so important? For example, let's take a car. When we understand how a car operates, for example, the engine, radiator, battery, brakes, wheels, and 
how all those parts fit together, we'll know what to do in order for the car to work properly. For example, is there enough gas? Is there enough air in the wheels? Et cetera, et cetera. And we can identify the signs that indicate there's going to be a problem with the car. So if there's a leakage or if there's a, there's a oil light that's on, we know that we have to uh, uh, put, uh, go to the mechanics. So knowing how your car works allows you to maintain and improve the car. Similarly, once we understand the structure of a conversation, we will be able to identify the first signs of any problems, address it, and ultimately have better conversations. So what is the structure of a conversation? Well, it turns out that no matter what the subject, our thoughts and feelings fall into the same three categories or conversations. The what happened conversation, the feelings conversation, and the identity conversation. So essentially, when you're having one conversation, you're actually having three conversations at once. And the what happened conversation revolves around truth, intentions, and blame. So this uh, generally uh, disagreements occur about, about truth, what happened or what should happen, who said what or who did what, disagreements about intentions, who meant what, and blame, who's right and who's wrong and who should we blame. The feelings conversation involves the feelings of both parties. Are my feelings valid? Are they appropriate? Should I acknowledge or deny them? Should I put them on the table or check them at the door? What do I do about the other person's feelings? Or what if they're angry or what if they're hurt? And finally, the identity conversation. This is a conversation we have with ourselves about what this situation means to us. So I am competent, I'm incompetent. I'm a good person, I'm a bad person. I'm lovable, I'm unlovable. And the identity conversation um, happens during or before, during, and after the difficult conversation. And it's a conversation that you have with yourself. So now let's recall my initial example and try to understand why I dreaded the upcoming conversation at that time. Um, so what happened? Well, my client and I were discussing accounting and the client, he, he didn't have experience in accounting and he expected me to have more experience and have, uh, give him more guidance. In terms of feeling, I was feeling pretty frustrated because it wasn't my responsibility to configure his chart of accounts. And my identity, I felt that because he was unhappy with my support, I felt I was incompetent. And so I concluded, you know, the upcoming conversation will be a difficult one. Dealing with successful, well, dealing successfully with difficult conversations involves managing these three conversations. There are certain challenges in each of the three conversations that we can't change. Situations where what happened is more complicated than we suspect, we'll, or we'll have information the other person is unaware of, and raising each other's awareness isn't easy. We may face emotionally charged situations that feel threatening because they put important aspects of our identity at risk. What we can change is the way we respond to each of these challenges. Instead of assuming we know all we need to know to understand and explain things, we can explore what information the other person might have that we don't. Or instead of hiding our feelings or letting loose in ways that we later regret, we could manage our feelings constructively. And instead of proceeding into the conversation as if it says nothing about us, we can explore the identity issues that may be deeply at stake for us or for them. So for the remainder of today's event, we'll dive into each conversation and examine the common pitfalls that we all make, which results in difficult or unproductive conversations. 
and then some helpful concepts and tools that will produce less stressful and more productive conversations. Um, these, thing, these concepts and tools I'll be sharing won't completely eliminate your anxiety or dread, but it will help reduce these feelings and give you more confidence in dealing with difficult conversations. So let's explore the what happened conversation. This conversation revolves around truth, intentions, and blame. And we make mistakes in each one. Um, the truth assumption is our first pitfall. This is when we focus the conversation on who's right and who's wrong. For example, I'm right that you drive too fast, that you are unable to mentor younger kids, that your comments at Thanksgiving were inappropriate, or I'm right that I deserve a raise. In all these cases, how does the other person respond to these assertions? Well, people instinctively will try to defend themselves. No, I'm not driving too fast. No, I am able to mentor others, or my comments were appropriate. But a conversation that revolves around I'm right and you're wrong results in a dead end conversation. The conversation goes nowhere as each party tries to defend their positions. So what should we do instead? Instead, we should focus the discussion on conflicting perceptions, interpretations, and values. So let's look at an example. Connie and Sandy live together as roommates. Uh, can someone read this for me? I'll read it. <laughs> I volunteer. Okay. Connie thinks her roommate is not cleaning up after herself. Sandy leaves the dishes in the sink all week and lets it pile up until the weekend. This is inconvenient for Connie when she wishes to cook because all the pans are dirty. The sink also starts to smell midweek. Although she doesn't want to bring it up, she does so after months of cleaning up after Sandy. We need to talk about how you're not doing the dishes. Sandy immediately defends herself. No, I do do the dishes. Why are you being so anal? I'm not being anal. You're just being a slob, etc., etc. Thanks, Kim. <laughs> That's fourth. This whole conversation uh, goes into becomes a dead end conversation where they just defend themselves, and it goes nowhere. And they they're just angry roommates now, and they'll probably not talk to each other and ignore each other for the for the next few weeks or something. So let's uh, analyze this conversation. Connie started the conversation with a truth assumption. She's right that Sandy doesn't do the dishes and is being a slob. That's just an assumption that she's making. So she started the conversation with an accusation. You're not doing the dishes. However, the real disagreement is not that Sandy isn't doing the dishes. In fact, there is no dispute between the two of them about how often Sandy cleans the dishes. They both agree that she cleans the dishes at the end of the week. The disagreement is over each person's standards of cleanliness. What does cleanliness mean to Connie? What does cleanliness mean to Sandy? And how to handle this discrepancy? These are not questions of right and wrong, but questions of interpretation and judgment. And we need to learn how to identify when we or the other party makes this assumption and move away from these types of conversations so that we can move away from dead end conversations to ones that allow us to explore what's happening, explore the perceptions and their values. Um, so what do I mean when I say move away from the truth assumption? What type of conversation can we have? Well, we can use, uh, we can initiate, initiate the conversation from the third story. And the third story means describing the problem between the parties in a way that rings true for both sides simultaneously. Uh, the key here is to describe the discrepancy um, between the two. So let's look at uh, another example um, here. 
So take Jack, the teacher confronting his student's mother, Nancy, about her son's troublesome behavior. Uh, can someone read this for me? Okay. Does anyone, hear, uh, do you guys hear me? Yep. Okay. Uh, from Inside Jack's Story, your son Nathan can be difficult in class, disruptive and argu argumentative. You've said in the past that things at home are fine, but something must be troubling him. Thanks, Amy. So Jack is making the truth assumption that Nathan's life at home is affecting his behavior at school. Uh, Nancy can view this as an accusation and she'll probably get really defensive and be like, yo, it's not like I'm mistreating my son or anything. It's like, it's not us. It's definitely not his home problems. So when Jack starts the conversation like this, it may lead to defensiveness and a dead end conversation. So instead of starting like that, what if he began from the third story? Um, Amy, can you read this, please? From the third story, I wanted to share with you my concerns about Nathan's behavior in class and hear more about your sense of what might be ha might be contributing to it. I know from our past conversation that you and I have different thinking on this. My sense is that if a child is having trouble at home, something is usually bothering him at home. And I know you have felt strongly that that that's not true in this case. Maybe together we can figure out what's motivating Nathan and how to handle it. Thanks. So stepping out of your story doesn't mean giving up your point of view. Your purpose in opening the conversation is to invite the other person into a joint exploration. Um, so yeah, so you want to start the conversation so that the other person doesn't get offended. Um, just because if she or he gets offended, it's, it's gonna lead to just an argument and there won't be any kind of explorations or discussion about how to solve the problem. So uh, I'm gonna break you guys out in your groups again. Uh, please take a minute or so with your group to talk about what Connie would say from the third story approach.
Welcome back. Gonna take a few more seconds while everyone comes back in. All right, welcome back, everyone. Would anyone uh, like to share what their group's hypothetical response? Uh, what would what would Connie say from the third story? First off, <laughs> <laughs> I mean. <laughs> I'll leave it. <laughs> um, okay, so what we talked about was tackling the problem. Um, I suggested that maybe along the lines of, hey, like I know you're doing the dishes once a week, um, you know, but it's a problem that the dishes are starting to smell um, before the week is over. Um, I was wondering if we can maybe make a plan as to um, which days we can wash the dishes throughout the week. That's it. <laughs> All right, thanks for sharing. How about uh, the other groups? Can someone share what they, uh, hypothetical response? Odin, go. Uh, okay. Uh, well, uh, in my group, I said that I noticed, or Kim mentioned to me that there is like this, there's a uh, clearly miscommunication on what cleanliness means to each person. And so I was just saying, um, I was just trying to see, I would gauge how the other person feels with cleanliness first by asking a question like, oh, is it me or is there like a lot of dishes in the sink right now? Like, is, is that just me? And then sort of gauge like, oh, do you smell that or something like that? Like, see, see where they're at and meet them where they're at and then go from there. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Jenny's group. Oh, uh, so awkward. I didn't, oh, I'm going to be very honest. I was not paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> Uh, did, you guys, did you guys talk about a hypothetical response, or should I just uh, skip? You? Just skip one. Okay, okay. Actually, okay. answer for you. So we could talk about how my roommates don't do the dishes. So, uh, <laughs> Odin, you were on your group was on the right track. Uh, starting from the third story is really trying to say it in a way starting the conversation in a way that won't make the other person defensive so for example connie could say hey sandy i wanted to talk to you about doing the dishes you and i have different preferences around when the dishes are done and different standards for what constitutes or appropriate or obsessive cleanliness so I wanted to explore some solutions with you that will satisfy both of our uh, standards. Does that does that kind of make sense? We're we're trying to make it so that we describe the difference between the two parties. Does that kind of make sense? Or should I, should, do you guys want another example? Makes sense. Okay, yeah. so that's one way that you can start the conversation so that the other party isn't as defensive. Um, but yeah, just keep, keep this in mind. We'll keep moving. So you can follow the third story guidelines even when you're not the initiator of the conversation. Um, you take whatever the other person says and use it as their half of a description for the third story. So that it includes both 
their perspective and also your perspective. Um, okay, uh, can someone help me read this? I'll read it. I got you. Thank you. Cool. All right. Third story examples, other party initiates. So from inside their story, we need to talk about how you are ruining the project because of your delayed responses. From the third story, it sounds like you're pretty unhappy with the time it takes for me to give you solutions. I have trouble with meeting your deadlines. So I think we have different expectations and assumptions about the project and working together. It seems like that would be a good thing for us to talk about. Thanks, Joey. All right, so as you can see here, if you started from inside your own story, we need to talk about how you're ruining the project. The other person's probably gonna become really defensive and they're just gonna be like, yeah, I'm not ruining the project, you're ruining the project or something like that. But if you started the conversation from the third point of view, you're just kind of pointing out the differences between you guys and then asking or inviting the other person to discuss um, about how to deal with it. So let's pretend we're Sandy now and Connie comes over and says, we need to talk about how you're not doing the dishes. Can you take a moment with your group to discuss Sandy's response? How, how can Sandy respond to Connie in the third Part, uh, third perspective, third story.
You guys are always the first ones that come back out of the breakout room. <laughs> Maybe we should use our time more, guys. <laughs> uh... I guess you guys have the best answer, huh? Yeah. Everyone else just kind of waits until the 60 seconds is up. Actually, I don't know how to change the second 60 second thing, but uh, yeah. The other group doesn't even do the work, that's why. Fucking <laughs> trolls. <laughs> oh, Steven's there? That's cool. Welcome back, everyone. Um, can someone share uh, what their group discussed and some possible response that Sandy can say to Connie's accusation? <laughs> Joey, would you like to start us off? J me? <laughs> yeah. All right, yeah, okay, cool. Uh, yeah, so what we discussed was it's like more rather than like third impartial point of view is like using less you statements and more like I feel statements. So I feel like uh sandy would say something like uh i feel like you uh think that we're not on the same cleanliness schedule um although i disagree about doing it more than once a week i'm willing to discuss it with you something like that like just to like uh open up that door of negotiation kind of thing yeah yeah that's really good um like you said um uh, sandy Sandy, you basically, well, your response was like, you know, Sandy acknowledges that there's a discrepancy between the two of them and you're willing to sh to uh, negotiate how the dishes are done. Uh, would anyone else from another group like to share what their group said? Mm, we basically kind of said the same thing. We were just like, um, Sandy would say like, oh, um, I do do the dishes, but on the weekends, like we have previously discussed, but if you want to rediscuss it, we can go ahead and do that. That's a very understandable response from Sandy. She sounds like a very understandable person. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and then Bowden's group. Um, our group kind of had the same response as the other two groups, like uh, focusing on I sentences as opposed to you sentences, and also like understanding from their point, like um, we like like Sandy might have like a level of cleanliness that's different from Connie's, and so like trying to find that middle ground. Okay, yeah. So it seems like all the groups, you guys are getting the hang of like third party perspective. Um, so an example of what she could have said is, you seem frustrated with how I'm doing the dishes. Uh, you prefer to do your dishes immediately after you're done eating, but I prefer to do my dishes at the end of the week. Uh, so we each have different preferences around when the dishes are done and different standards for what constitutes cleanliness. Um, let's explore some solutions that will satisfy both of us. So essentially what you're doing is if someone accuses you, take their words and then reframe it into a third part, into a third story that includes both your perspective and their perspective. And this third story is really trying to describe what's the difference between you two. So right here, the situation is that the difference is we just have different preferences on when the dishes are done and what constitutes as cleanliness. Okay, uh, moving on. The second pitfall we make in the what happened conversation is to assume we know the intentions of others when we don't. Uh, worse, when we are unsure about someone else's intentions, we often decide that they are bad. Um, how does this 
relate to us. While you may have felt annoyed or offended by a family member, a friend, a coworker, or a random stranger on the street, uh, when he or she did something at one point in time that made you feel hurt, um, for example, we feel hurt, therefore they intended to hurt us. We feel slighted, therefore they intended to slight us. Or we feel sad, therefore they intended to make us sad. And perhaps the biggest danger of assuming that the other person had bad intentions is that we easily jump from they had bad intentions to they're a bad person. So we settle into judgments about their character, um, and this affects not only how we converse with them, but also our entire relationship with them. Um, in this comic, Dilbert and Peter are having a conversation. Before Dilbert even explains his reasoning, Peter dismisses him, saying, you're just trying to sabotage me because you're jealous of my success. And this might be because Peter felt hurt in a previous interaction with Dilbert, therefore Peter thinks Dilbert intended to sabotage him. So how can we avoid the mistake of attributing intentions to others so that we can have better conversations? We can do so by first recognizing that there's a difference between impact and intention. Separate impact from intention requires us to be more aware of the leap from I was hurt to you intended to hurt me. So you can do so, disentangle impact and intent, intent by asking yourself three questions. What did the other person actually say or do? What was the impact of this on me? And based on this impact, what assumption am I making about what the other person intended? Um, so yeah, separate the intent and impact. And once you've answered these three questions, the next step is to make absolutely certain that you recognize that your assumption about their intentions is just an assumption. It's a guess. You don't know if it's actually true or not. And yeah, your hypothesis is maybe it's based on something um, by what they said or what they did, but you could be wrong. So you can answer, you can start the conversation by following these three steps. Say what the other person did, tell them what its impact was on you, and explain your assumption about their intentions, making sure that you label it as a assumption. So for example, let's say that your colleague talks over you all the time, um, and you want to bring it up to your colleague. How would you do that? Um, so can someone read this? Uh, so examples. Number one, I notice that you start talking when I am not finished talking. Number two, when you do that, I feel frustrated because I have important information to share. And then number three, then what I wonder is whether you do this on purpose because you don't value my input. That's what I'm thinking when it happens. Yeah, thanks, Amy. So what this example is, it's following these three steps. Um, making sure that you say what the other person did. I noticed that you start talking when I'm not finished. And then you tell them what its impact was on you. When you do that, I feel frustrated because I have important information I want to share. And then you tell them your assumption about their intentions. Um, some defensiveness is inevitable. The other person may you know, just come off as, just be like, oh, like you're attacking me but you can always steer the conversation away from that. You know, you just really want to try to understand why they keep talking over you. Um, so here's another example. Um, can someone else read this? Consider the story of Lori and Leo who have been in a relationship for two years and have a recurring fight that is painful to both of them. The couple was at a party thrown by some friends and Lori was about to reach for another scoop of ice cream. When Leo said, Lori, why don't you lay off the ice cream? Lori, who struggles with her weight, shot Leo a nasty look and the two avoided each other for a while. Thanks, Amy. So 
how can Lori bring this incident up to Leo and share the impact it had on her? Um, take a few minutes with your group to talk about Lori's possible response um, to Leo's words. Hello, one welcome back. <laughs> Would anyone like to share what their group's response was to um, oh. Lori? How can Lori bring this incident up to Leo and share the impact it had on her? Yeah, Kim, go, Kim, go. <laughs> Question first. Come on. Oh, can I ask yes. um, Are the breakout groups recorded? Just wondering. No, no, they're not. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm gonna say it's okay. Anyways, go ahead, Kimba. All right. So my wonderful group, group number one. Um, what do we say? Sorry. We said <laughs> the name Lori. Lori was the one. Okay. So Lori could say, "Hey, Leo, we're not friends anymore." <laughs> okay. Yeah. Leo. Um, you said you saying that I I should stop lay off the ice cream makes me feel like you think that I am inadequate and it pokes at my esteem because I've been struggling with this and so it yeah yeah it makes me feel like you're 
you don't think I have self-control and you think of me as, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Kim. Yeah, so like you, you, what you did, yep, yeah, was exactly what, say what the other person did, tell them what its impact was on you and explain your assumption that, you know, you, th Laurie thinks that Leo doesn't, uh, he doesn't think, uh, well, she thinks that he <laughs> uh, doesn't have enough self-control. So, and the impact on her was that, you know, this makes her feel really bad and stuff. So, yeah. Uh, would anyone else in the other two groups like to share their response? I'm yeah. curious about Jenny's group. Oh yeah, Jenny's group, yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, so Leo to mind his own business? <laughs> like, <laughs> <not yet. laughs> Okay, fine. I wrote it down just in case somebody called on me. Okay, so if I was Lori, I would be like, hey, uh, Leo, when you said uh, dot, dot, dot earlier, it really hurt my feelings. I don't know what your intentions were, but if it was supposed to be a joke, it wasn't funny. And like him said, uh, I struggle with weight my whole life. So what you said was really hurtful. And I know you don't know any of that. So next time don't Poor mouth. yeah 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 there you go <laughs> i didn't finish writing it scrub oh yeah perfect exactly what you said um you know laurie should say you know what you did when you said when you said lay off the ice cream this is how i felt about it and you probably didn't know how i felt but this is how i felt about it and that's a really good way to just, you know, open up the conversation so that he's not super defensive about it and so that you guys could talk more about how to handle future, future uh, situations like that. Um, Steven's group? Yeah, I think Crystal uh, knocked it out of the park this time. So, you know, we just got to echo what, what she said. She brought up really good points. Like, <laughs> she basically spoke for like the whole time nonstop. So she was like, uh, yeah. You know, she was like, Leo, um, remember at first you told me to lay off the ice cream? Um, well, that was really hurtful to me. And, um, you know, this is not the first time you said it. So it seems like, you know, you are trying to tell me something that hurts me a lot. And, um, you know, this is like the 50th time. So, you know, we're done. I'm, I, uh, I mean, uh, oh no, she, didn't, she didn't say that. I forgot what Crystal said. She said a lot, so uh, it's pretty much, yeah, it's pretty much it. Okay, thank you, Steven. Yeah. Um, like you said, a good way to start the conversation. Say what the other person did when, Leo, when you said, when you called me out in front of everyone at the party, you know, lay off the ice cream, I felt hurt. Just a statement that you shared with them, you know, I think, uh opens up the conversation so here's like a possible conversation that they could have can someone read this for me please i can read Lori. can someone be leo i'll be leo <laughs> <laughs> all right you know when you said why don't you lay off the ice cream well i felt hurt by that you did yeah I was just trying to help you stay on your diet. Why does that make you feel upset? I felt embarrassed that you said in front of our said it in front of our friends. Then I wonder is then what I wonder is whether you said it on purpose to embarrass or hurt me. I don't know why you'd want to do that, but that's what I'm thinking when it happens. Well, I'm certainly not doing it on purpose. I guess I didn't realize it was so upsetting. I'm confused about what it is you want me to say if I see you going off your diet. Perfect. Thank you, Kim and Amy. So this conversation is an example of, um, you know, when Lori shares the impact um, on her from what Leo said, she's doing it in such a way that he's not feeling as defensive. And as you can see, uh, this conversation is just beginning, but it's off to a better start than if she just said, like, you're hurting, you're like, 
why are you so why are you being so mean or something like that so yeah good uh, very good everyone um side note just because leo didn't intend to do it on purpose good intentions don't sanitize bad impact so another problem with assuming that good intentions um sanitize a negative impact is that intentions are often more complex than just good or bad leo probably didn't like probably wasn't trying to hurt her but at the same time he said it in front of everyone else so there might be some intentions that are good and bad when he said that so yeah just just take note of that okay and then finally the third pitfall that people fall into is the blame frame um, most difficult conversations focus significant attention on who's to blame for example when the dog disappears who's to blame the person who opened the gate or the one who failed to grab her collar or maybe when the tub over overflows and ruins the living room ceiling below should we blame the forgetful ba bather the spouse who called the person downstairs the manufacturer who designed an overflow drain that is too small or the plumber who failed to mention it but focusing on blame hinders problem solving it evokes fear of punishment and insists on an either or answer so note that our natural reaction is you know if you blame me i'm gonna want to defend myself because i'm a good person so just take note of that when you start conversations um focusing instead on understanding how each party contributed to the problem allows us to learn about the real causes of the problem and to work on correcting them so when a conversation is focused on contribution from each party for example what i did or what i didn't do and what they did or they didn't do it allows you to first of all it allows you to raise the conversation easier um, it's easier than raising a blame conversation because blame frame creates a burden. So you, you like you have to feel confident that the others are at fault and that you aren't at fault to feel justified in raising an issue. Uh, if you don't feel confident, you may not even raise the issue, even if it is affecting you. But when you start a conversation from a contribution frame of mind, it encourages a conversation of exploration and curiosity rather than uh, one of blame. So conclusion about the what happened conversation. Ultimately, difficult conversations are never about getting the facts right. It's more about conflicting perceptions, interpretations, and values. We want to work on moving the conversation from certainty, you're right and I'm wrong, to, or I'm right and you're wrong, to one of curiosity so instead of asking yourself how can they think like that you ask yourself i wonder what information they have that i don't or instead of immediately getting defensive when someone accuses you you can take a breath and you know wonder what the other person perceives to make him or her say something like that so Bottom line is certainty locks us out of the conversation and curiosity lets us in. Okay, so difficult conversations are not only about what happened, but also they involve emotions. The feelings conversation does not focus on whether or not you or the other person feels emotions, but how to deal with them when they arise. Bringing up feelings can seem scary or uncomfortable and can make us feel vulnerable. Uh, in the presence of strong feelings, many of us work hard to stay rational. Getting too deep into feelings is messy. It clouds good judgment and in some contexts, for example, when you're at work, can seem inappropriate. The problem is that when feelings are at the heart of what's going on, they're the business at hand and ignoring them is pretty much impossible. They will leak into the conversation even if you don't explicitly say it. Um, it makes it really difficult to listen to what the other person says if you are holding all that emotion in. And it takes a toll on the relationship itself. Um, so yeah, our failure to acknowledge and discuss feelings can derail a number of difficult conversations. And most of us assume that we know how we feel like we just know, you know, I just feel, I feel happy or I just feel sad. 
but in fact, we often don't know how we feel. We'll be in this inner ring right here of this wheel, like mad, scared, powerful, sad. We'll label our feelings in this inner ring. However, feelings are more complex and nuanced than we usually imagine. You're sad. Is that a bored sad, a lonely sad, or an inadequate sad? What's more, feelings are really good at disguising themselves. Feelings we are uncomfortable with disguise themselves as emotions we're better at handling. So for example, you're feeling, you think you're feeling really critical, but in fact, you're actually feeling insecure. So feelings can be, you know, maybe we don't know our feelings, um, but in order to have better conversations and also to have a healthier mentality, we must all learn to, one, accept that feelings are normal and natural, two, identify the spectrum of feelings, three, recognize that good people can have bad feelings, and Finally, learn that your feelings are as important as the other parties. So what's the pitfall we fall in terms of the feelings conversation? Um, we often translate our feelings into judgments, attributions, characterizations, and problem solving. For example, judgment. If you were a good friend, you would have been there for me. Attribution. Why were you trying to hurt me? Or characterization. You're just so inconsiderate and problem solving. The answer is for you to call me more often versus actually just telling the other per person how we feel. I feel hurt, I feel confused, I'm embarrassed. Uh, these statements can be viewed or the judgment attribution characterization problem solving statements, they can be viewed as accusations which, like we discussed earlier, can lead to defensiveness and misunderstandings. Um, a second danger is that the attributions themselves are so consuming that we fail to see the real feelings that are motivating them. So what does this all mean? To have a better conversation, avoid judgments, attributions, characterizations, and problem solving, and just state your feelings. Uh, here's a tool. Begin with, when you, X, I feel Y. Uh, this is a simple act that carries with it extraordinary benefits. It keeps the focus on feelings and makes clear that you're speaking only from your perspective. Uh, it avoids the translation trap of ac accusation. For example, why do you, the manager, insist on undermining me in front of my colleagues? Um, your manager will probably feel pretty offended that you're talking to her like that, and then will proceed to defend herself saying, you know, like, what do you mean? Like, I'm not talking to you like that or something else like that. Instead, if you say to your manager, when you yell at me in front of my peers for an unintended mistake, I feel embarrassed and unmotivated. Your manager is less likely to feel defensive and more likely to engage in a conversation about your feelings, theirs, and maybe a strategy that you can develop together. Plus, the other person can't argue with how you feel. You know, you can't, you feel how you feel. Um, so this tool is helpful if when you want to bring something up to another individual. Um, what if the, um, yeah, so, here. Okay, so uh, let's practice this. Uh, you can use these examples or use one of your own, but write down a judgment, attribution, characterization, or problem solving statement um, that you said or you could see yourself saying to someone else, and then reframe it with the when you blank, I feel blank statement. So let's just take a few minutes here.
All right, welcome back everyone. Who wants to share what their group discussed? Henry. Oh, Henry, thank you. Yeah, Henry. In my group, we were discussing about how when they call me out to talk, I feel embarrassed. It makes me feel embarrassed, so yeah. Thank you. That's a that's a great. So when when we called you out, you felt embarrassed. Statement. It's your feelings. I can't argue against that. Awesome. Uh, who else? Oh, Andy, I think. Uh, okay. Um, yeah. when you take up the only parking spot in the house, I feel that you have no consideration for other people who try. It's parsing. Thank you. That was really good. So you said when you take up the parking spot, which is what the other person did, I feel, you know, like you're not respecting me or the other people in the house. Perfect. And, uh, Jenny's group Jenny's group uh, okay. okay so uh Nat was like oh you drink too much boba so I said when you tell me I drink too much boba I feel that you're oppressing me because it is the only thing that makes me happy anymore because of crippling depression yeah thank you Jenny okay so like you guys all did it very perfectly when you statement, I feel statement. And this is just a tool for you guys to initiate the conversation, right? It's a, it just allows you to feel less defensive and um, opens the conversation for exploring what we can do or what we shouldn't do next time. But at the same time, it addresses that, you know, you're concerned about a certain issue. That makes sense. Perfect. Okay. Another tool I wanted to share with you is what if we find that we're being accused of bad intentions and our initial reaction is, you know, defensiveness. That's not what I intended. You know, I'm not trying to hurt you and stuff like that. So we see how that leads to trouble when someone accuses you and then you defend yourself. Dead end conversation, right? It's just dead end because everyone's just defending themselves. So this tool, um, basically, this is the definition of an accusation. It has two parts. The first is that one, we had bad intentions. And then two, the other person was feeling frustrated, hurt, or embarrassed. So for example, if you were a good friend, you would have been there for me. That's an accusation. Um, but what, what this actually entails is one, you intended to hurt me, and two, I was hurt when you were not there. So these are two separate things that we, that consists of an accusation, but we tend to focus on the first part, that we had bad intentions, and we'll, we'll just automatically defend ourselves. So the key is to address part two first, before part one. Don't pretend that they aren't saying the first part, you'll want to respond to it, but neither should you ignore the second part. And if you start by listening and acknowledging their feelings, and then return to the questions of intentions, it'll make your conversation significantly easier and more constructive. So what does it mean to acknowledge someone's feelings? Um, it means that you're letting the other person know that what they said has made an impression on you. It means that their feelings matter to you and that you're working to understand them. Um, some examples that you say in order to acknowledge the other person is, wow, you, I, I never felt, I never knew you felt that way. Or I kind of assumed you were feeling that and I'm glad you felt comfortable enough with me to share it. Or it sounds like this is really important to you. By letting them know that 
your that you think understanding their perspective is important it'll, it'll open up the conversation more um okay so let's practice um so let's now say, hypothetically, if someone else read these judgments, attributions, characterizations, or problem-solving statement to you, let's say, for example, that I was the one that said, if you were a good friend, you would have been there for me. <laughs> um, so let's use the tool that I just uh, shared with you. How would you acknowledge their feelings? Um, I'm going to open the groups, take a minute or two to discuss. Actually, can you guys like screenshot this or? Huh. Oh, let, let me just copy this into the chat so you guys have reference. Okay. And then, okay. So take a, take a two minutes or something.
Welcome back, everyone. Who would like to start a will share what their group said in terms of how would you acknowledge the other person's feelings if, for example, they said, if you were a good friend, you would have been there for me. Question. Yes. We were confused as to whether this was like the same situation and it was just like different like framings and a <laughs> we were just confused about what we were well, okay. to discuss. Yeah. So, so this this activity is focused on hypothetically, what if the other person accuses you, or you know, what if the other person felt hurt and he or she wanted to bring it up with you, and they, you know, they didn't study what we're studying right now, so they'll just say, if you were a good friend, you would have been there for me. So are you going to react defensively and say, I am a good friend. I've always been there for you. It's just this one time. Or are you going to try and acknowledge their feelings first before addressing their first, uh, before addressing the second part, which is that we had bad intentions. So the point of this activity is to just kind of get used to taking a deep breath and swallowing that defensiveness and then say, acknowledge that their feelings, acknowledge their feelings. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, How do you acknowledge their feelings? Like what's the phrasing that you would use? What was that? Um, good question. Mm -hmm. So if someone said this to me, if you were a good friend, you would have been there for me. I would say, it sounds like you were hurt that I wasn't there. Um, can you and I'm I never I kind of assumed you were feeling that way but you know I'm glad you were feeling comfortable enough to share with me can you tell me more so this is just starting the conversation you're 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 basically you're trying to reframe the conversation so that it's more productive in terms of exploring like okay why was that person hurt and what can I or what can he do to not be heard in the future. Cool. Okay, so let's try the second example. What if someone said to you, why were you trying to hurt me? What would you say? Steven, is that you scratching your nose or are you volunteering? <laughs> Why were you trying to hurt me? Um, uh, so if somebody said that to me, why were you trying to hurt me? I acknowledge their feelings. So I'm like, oh, oh, you're hurt. Um, I see you have been hurt by what I said. You remind me what I said because I didn't even realize you were hurt, but now I know that you're hurt. So your state of hurtness I have just acknowledged and thus we will continue our conversation. <laughs> okay, so that's basically the gist, yeah. You basically want to reiterate what they said. If they didn't explicitly say that they were hurt, but you can tell from their tone, just be like, oh, it seems like you're really hurt by this. Can you tell me more? Right? So basically, you're trying to open the conversation up. Um, okay, so we're running out of time. So I'm just going to move on. But feel free to look at my slides later if you want to practice. So the conclusion of the feelings conversation is that ultimately, um, feelings matter and they are complex. Meaning that even if you think you're happy, what what exactly is that happy? Is that like uh, excited happy or, you know, <laughs> they're very complex and take the time, taking the time to reflect on your feelings is really important. Um, also note that the feelings, in the feelings conversation, we tend to make judgments, attributions, characterizations, and problem solving that um, produce 
defensiveness from the other party. Either you accuse them or they accuse you through making these types of statements. And that could lead to a unproductive conversation. But, you know, by sharing how you felt from, from uh, the, the conversation uh, from when you did this, I feel blank. That just brings the conversation to a more exploratory conversation. Or if they accused you, you want to first acknowledge their feelings before opening up the conversation. Okay, finally, we come to our last, but the most subtle and the most challenging conversation, the identity conversation. This conversation is the one we have with ourselves. How does what happened affect my self-esteem or my self-image or my sense of who I am in the world? What impact will I have on my future? What self-doubts do I harbor? Managing our identity offers us significant leverage in managing our anxiety and improving our skills in the other two conversations. So anytime a conversation feels difficult, it means that something beyond the apparent substance of the conversation is at stake for you. So what does it mean if, let's say your client is unhappy and complains? Or what does it mean for you if you ask for a raise and get rejected? Or what does it mean if you deliver bad news? Are you incompetent? So even when, um, so when our self image is threatened, we lose our balance, which may cause us to lose confidence in ourselves, to lose concentration, or to forget what we were going to say. And in the worst case, in the worst scenario, we may feel paralyzed. Um, you know, you may even feel like you have trouble breathing. But by just knowing that the identity conversation is a component of a difficult conversation, it can help you. You can't quake proof your sense of self, meaning that there's always gonna be times when your identity is questioned or when you feel threatened, but the, or when your identity feel threatened. But the good news is that you can improve your ability to recognize and cope with identity issues when they occur. So thinking clearly and honestly about who you are can help reduce your anxiety during conversations and significantly improve or strengthen your foundation after. So um, one tool that we can use or one concept is don't form your identity around the all or nothing mentality. Don't, for example, say I'm either all good or I'm all evil. I'm 100% competent or I'm just incompetent. I'm worthy of love or I'm not worthy of love at all. Um, the primary peril of the all or nothing thinking is that it leaves us, it leaves our identity extremely unstable making us hypersensitive to feedback. So when you're faced with negative information about yourself, the all or nothing gives a mentality, gives us only two choices for how to manage that information. Either we try to deny the information that is inconsistent with our self image, or we do the opposite. We take in the information in a way that exaggerates its importance to a crippling degree. And we may just let it affect us to a really bad scale. So what do we do? Well, first, um, ground your identity. Um, improving your ability to manage the identity conversation comes with first um, being familiar with the identity issues that are important to you so that you can spot them during a conversation. Um, for example, uh, Observe whether there's patterns to what tends to knock you off balance during difficult conversations and why. What about your identity feels at risk? What does it mean to you? And how would it feel if what you fear was true? Um, for, let's say, for example, if you notice that you get knocked off balance during a difficult conversation when the other party doesn't maintain eye contact with you um, and you you feel super angry about this. Um, maybe you've been taught that maintaining eye contact is a sign of engagement and respect. 
that if the other person isn't making eye contact with you, you consider yourself um, someone who's not worthy of respect or something. And their actions means they're not respecting you, so you're feeling insignificant. Um, so that's just an example. Uh, the second step to improving your ability to manage your identity conversation is to learn to integrate new information into your identity in ways that are healthy. Um, so it requires you to let go of the all or nothing um, stance. Um, so what you want to do is really complexify your your identity making sure that you know um no one is always for example if you say i'm always a good listener no you, there's probably times when you don't listen or when you get distracted or when you think to yourself i'm always there for my children you know you, you can't always anything right so there's always going to be times when you do something bad or when you make a mistake or whatnot. So this concept about complexifying your identity, it's just acknowledging the fact that you're not always anything. If you think you're good at something and you're, you're like, you're always, I'm, a, I'm always competent at work. That's probably not true. There's probably gonna be sometimes when I'm late for work or when I fail to turn in a report or something. Um, so the and stance gives you a place from which you can assert your views and feelings without having to diminish anyone else's. Um, let's see. So can someone help me read this paragraph? Ben's fear of telling his boss that he has accepted another job is a good example of this. Is Ben loyal or is he a sellout? Both of those are simplifying labels that can't capture the complexity of the endless interactions Ben has had with the many people in his life. He has made many sacrifices for his family and many for his boss. He has worked weekends, turned down other job offers, worked hard to help the company recruit top talent. The list of things Ben has done that indicates loyalty is long and deep. And Ben is leaving his job for higher paying work elsewhere. It's reasonable for his boss to feel abandoned. That doesn't mean Ben is a bad person. It doesn't mean Ben has made a choice based on greed. He wants to put his children through college. He has been undercompensated for years and has not complained. What then is the bottom line on Ben? The bottom line is that there is no bottom line. Ben can feel good about many of his actions and choices and ambivalent or regretful about others. Life is too complex for any reasonable person to feel otherwise. Indeed, a self-image that allows for complexity is healthy and robust. It provides a sturdy foundation on which to stand for. Thanks, Amy. So this is an example of how to really change your mindset. If you're in the all or nothing mentality, um, try to complexify your identity so that if someone does accuse you of being a bad worker, you know, you can regain your balance more easily because you know, you've done stuff that says that you're a good worker. Um, even if you have done other stuff that says that you're a bad worker. So it's, this is a mindset that we should all practice. Uh, we should practice. So what if you lose your balance and what if someone accuses you of something and you, you know, you just feel super down. Um, so four things. First, let go of trying to control their reaction. Don't go into a conversation with the purpose of avoiding bad reactions. Because like we saw earlier, you can't, you can't, um, you can't uh, say to someone else that they can't feel mad or they can't feel sad because you can't control someone else's feelings, right? You can't argue against that. Um, instead, adopt the and stance 
know that your identity is complex. For example, like we saw in the previous example, Ben is a good worker, but there's also sometimes when he's a bad worker. Um, number two, prepare for their response. If you're feeling very anxious about a difficult conversation, just run it through in your mind beforehand so that even if what you imagine come true, you already thought of it, so you're not as surprised when they say or they accuse you of something. Uh, number three, imagine that it's three months or 10 years from now. Does it still matter then? Do you still see yourself as that person that they're accusing you of? And then number four, just take a break, go for a walk. You'll probably feel better. Um, and finally, for the identity, um, three things to accept about yourself. You will make mistakes. Your intentions are complex and you have probably cont contributed to the problem, either from your, in your actions or your inaction. Uh, last thing, so don't do the hit and run. Uh, don't be passive aggressive about stuff. Uh, for example, if you say to someone who's late most of the times, late again, eh, that's just, you know, being passive aggressive. You're kind of, you're kind of saying something, but you're not really addressing it. Uh, same example for the second one. I see you're still drinking up a storm. So maybe this person is trying to bring it up in a joking manner. Um, but if you really want to address the problem, a good rule to follow is if you're going to talk, just talk. Don't do this kind of under the cloud kind of in the forest kind of thing. Okay, so uh, in conclusion, the identity conversation. Um, oh shit, I didn't, okay, well, this was the feelings one, but the identity conversation is you wanna try and make your identity more complex so that if someone accuses you of something, you're less likely to feel defensive about it and have more confidence in yourself that you're, you're not always anything. You can be good, you could be bad, you could make mistakes, or you could be a really good person sometimes, but it's not ever always, you're not always anything. Uh, so in conclusion, this whole workshop was really trying to share how to move toward a learning conversation from a, a dead end conversation about what's, uh, who's right or who's wrong to complexifying your identity, to acknowledge both sides' feelings and to, um, to, stay, to start a conversation in a way that will allow for more exploration, more discussion, more problem solving. So a more learning conversation. Uh, going back to my original example, when my client filed a complaint, um, if we apply the three conversations to uh, this example, um, I found that I didn't dread the upcoming conversation so much. For example, what happened? There's just a disagreement with how my client and I uh, configure the accounting. And my client probably feels worried and overwhelmed because he's implementing a new system that's gonna affect his entire business. I'm feeling anxious about the project and about underperforming. And finally, in terms of identity, it's not that I'm incompetent. Uh, I've done a lot of things that have showed that I'm a competent person. I come to work on time. I spend a lot of time learning the software. I do a lot of presentations. Um, but at the same time, there are times when I'm not a good worker, when I miss a deadline, when I get clients angry, stuff like that. So I view the upcoming conversation as one more of inquiry, contribution, and problem solving rather than a conversation that I feel super anxious about. All right, uh, that ends my 
my event for today. Thanks everyone for attending today's training. I hope you guys got a lot of, out of it and that your future conversations will be less anxiety inducing and more explore, exploratory. Um, yeah. Thank you, Carmen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next spread event is, uh, it's gonna be by Steven. He's gonna do the November elections. So we're gonna talk about things on the ballot. Um, so there's a few, there's a lot of things on the ballot. So it might be part one and part two. Uh, we might split it up just because there's a lot of things to talk about, but uh, be on the lookout and I'll send the invites soon. Thanks, Carmen. Thank you for the vote. Check your registration, everyone. Oh, yeah. Make a plan on how to get your ballot back, too.